Hello and welcome everyone. This is a two parts video where we are going to explain what is the issue of poorly water soluble drugs and the different methods to overcome this issue. First, poor water soluble drugs are of a big issue through oral route delivery because for any drug in order to be absorbed through GI wall to the blood, it need to undergo the solution where drug in solid form become a solution. Then, if it exhibit good permeability, it can cross the membrane. But poorly water-soluble drugs, as their name suggests, they hate water, so they have low tendency to dissolute in water to form solution. And therefore, majority of a drug stays in solid state and fails to pass membrane. Drug solubility is an important parameter to achieve desired concentration of a drug in the blood and to achieve a desired outcome. So generally, poorly water-soluble drugs have poor bioavailability and therefore require higher doses in order to reach a therapeutic plasma concentration. And that increases both the dosage form and the cost. Otherwise, if we stick with the low dose of a drug, it will not result in enough concentration in the blood and at the site of action, therefore leads to therapeutic failure. And since these drugs are poorly water soluble, they could be affected by situations like pH and food that either increases or decreases their absorption, resulting in variable plasma profile. Imagine patient X taking denazole. If she takes it immediately after her lunch, what will happen is more denazole will be absorbed because food in the GI will increase the release of the bile from the gallbladder, a normal physiological response. Bile contains some surfactants that solubilize fats and poorly water-soluble drugs, thus increases the absorption of these drugs across the GI wall and result in a plasma profile like this one here. This remains a huge problem because approximately 70% of drugs in the development are low water-soluble drugs or poorly water-soluble, and they have low dissolution rate and therefore low bioavailability. So what could we do to manage this issue? There are various methods that enhance the dissolution rate of poorly water-soluble drugs, and these include improving drug water solubility, increasing surface area by particle size reduction, solid dispersion, use of surfactant, and finally, lipid emulsifying system. In this video, we are going to cover the first three methods, and last two ones will be in part two. Starting with improving drug solubility. Since these drugs show poor dissolution due to their poor intrinsic solubility, we can work from here. By improving the solubility of the drug, we can improve the dissolution rate and the subsequent bioavailability. Solubility can be improved by different ways, such as salt formation and crystal structure change. Before we go into how each technique works, let's quickly remember the concept of solubility. There are three main steps happen when drug dissolute, starting with breaking the solute-solute interaction, so the drug-particles interaction, followed by forming a cavity inside the solvent, so like inside the water, where the solute will be in. Third is formation of solvent-solute interaction, so water-drug interaction, to make a solution. Since always the steps that form a new interaction produce energy, 
and steps break interaction require energy, so step one needs an energy input, while step three gives energy output. And to say a drug has good solubility, energy output in step three must be greater than energy input in step one. The input energy depends on the strength of solute-solute interaction. So how strong the bond between the drug particles or how hard it is to break this interaction, which can be determined by melting point, crystal structure, and solid state property. While energy output in step three depends on solute solvent interaction, which is determined by polarity and ionization. Now, if we get this concept well, understanding the methods will not be hard. Let's see how salt formation improves the solubility of these poorly water soluble drugs. This technique targets step three output. By changing the ionization state of the drug, it increases the energy output and therefore result in better solute solvent interaction which means better solubility and more dissolution of the drug. Salt is formed when poorly water-soluble drug is dissolved with organic solvent to form a solution. Then, solution is mixed with base or acid, depend on the drug nature. So if our drug is base, we add acid. Or if it was an acid, we add base. The acid and the base will form together a salt, which can be precipitated and isolated. Now, after the drug salt is prepared, it can be administered, and it would result in better dissolution compared to the non-salt form of the drug. See the example of para-aminosalicylic acid, or PAS. When it is used as a free acid, it showed a solubility of 1.6, where when it was used as a potassium salt, the solubility increased to 100, and the sodium one has a solubility of 500. So the salt has better solubility, which means better dissolution rate and better bioavailability compared to the non-salt form. What we can also get from this example is Different salts will have different solubility, depending on which type of acid or base we used. Moving on to the second technique of improving dissolution by improving solubility, which is changing the crystal structure of a drug. In order to increase the solubility of a drug, we can not only play around with the step 3, but also we can change the energy required in step 1 by decreasing the solute-solute interaction. This can be done by changing the crystal structure of a drug. Amorphous is less packed. Therefore, the drug particles have less interactions compared to crystal structure, where drug particles are highly packed and close to each other. So let's say a drug X which is a poorly water-soluble one, is presented in a crystal structure. If we change it from crystal to amorphous, we will improve its solubility because we made it less tight, which means lower solute-solute interaction. And this leads to less energy requirement in order to break this interaction. Therefore, energy input in step 1 is reduced. If it is that simple, then why don't we make all poorly water-soluble drugs in amorphous form so we can overcome this whole drama? Well, the issue with amorphous is the physical stability of these drugs. On shelf or during storage, amorphous will automatically change back to crystal because it is more stable form. 
but unfortunately, crystal is a poorly soluble form of the drug. So generally, this method is effective, but have an issue with the drug's stability. Okay, another simple method is particle size reduction, where drug particles are basically reduced in size to increase their dissolution rate. As you can see in the graph on your right side, when particle size reduces, surface area increases. Larger surface area allows greater interaction with the solvent, which increases the dissolution rate of a drug. There are many techniques used to reduce a drug particle size, such as milling, nanocrystallization, and spray drying. However, again some problems with physical stability. Because the small particles with time will go back or aggregate together to form bigger particle that has low surface area. One main point need to be highlighted here is that this method affect the dissolution rate without altering the intrinsic solubility of the drug, unlike the previous ones. Since we got that done, now let's see another method used to improve the dissolution rate of poorly water-soluble drugs, which is solid dispersion. It simply apply the concept of particle size reduction, but in a smart way. It is done by dispersing drug in a water-soluble carrier in liquid form, then solidify it to make it a solid form of the drug and the carrier. I know that sounds a lot, but it's actually very simple. It starts by reducing the particle size of the drug and then cover it by a carrier. So instead of a mixture of a drug and a carrier, we are dispersing the drug in the carrier, which means this carrier surround each particle and act like a physical barrier that prevent these small particles from aggregating together to form larger particle. And by this, we overcome the problem of the physical instability faced with particle size reduction method. This is simply solid dispersion concept. And with this, we reach the end of part one. I hope it was helpful. If you have any question, please leave a comment. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.